I extend a very warm welcome to guests. If you attended the con concert uh, on Friday night or Saturday night, I know you were blessed, and uh, it's wonderful to have you here. We do want to make sure to, again, remind you that Christianity Explored starts next week at 9 o'clock. There's going to be a free breakfast in the Fellowship Hall, and then Christianity Explored will start next week, 9 o'clock in the morning, and it will go for seven weeks. It's a wonderful opportunity to learn about the basics of who Jesus is and to really investigate what he can do for you as Lord and Savior. I also wanted to uh, thank Pastor Jeff and Dr. Sunil for covering for me last week when I was recovering from strep. They did a wonderful job ministering the word, and I'm just so grateful for those brothers who stepped to the plate uh, with not a lot of notice, and so I'm very grateful to them. Also, if you weren't able to be here last week, you missed an important ministry transition announcement from Pastor Dave. And everyone should have received an email on, from the church on Wednesday. Uh, but if you didn't, there are printed copies available on those oak tables out in the lobby, so please pick one up. I wanted to let everyone know that the congregational reception for the Scots will be on January 6th, immediately after the evening service. And the staff luncheon will be on January 8th at noon. So please mark your calendars and plan to be there to honor uh, the Scots for their six years of ministry here at Calvary Bible Church. Now, if you were unable to attend the concert on Friday or Saturday, make sure you don't miss tonight because it's the last one. It starts at 6 p.m., and you will not want to miss this incredible time of celebrating our Lord's birth. And it is the theme of the Lord's birth that we now turn to. If you want to open in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, we're going to be talking about seven reasons we have to rejoice at Christmas time, seven glorious truths that we celebrate at Christmas. And this is in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. In the context of Hebrews chapter 2, the writer has been comparing Jesus to the angels and showing us that he is exalted above the angels and is the one who has promised to come and to save us from our sins. And in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning with four, verse 14, we read, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. This is a wonderful text to study at Christmas time, and we're going to see, as I said, seven glorious truths that we celebrate at Christmas time. At Christmas, we celebrate the incarnation, right, that Jesus came. At Christmas, we celebrate the invasion, the invasion of the kingdom of darkness. At Christmas, we celebrate our independence, our freedom from slavery to sin and death. We celebrate our immortality that we have received eternal life. If we believe in Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. At Christmas, fifth, we celebrate our inclusion, that we are included in the gospel promise, that good news. And then we celebrate our immunity, that because of Jesus' payment on the cross for sin, because of his death, burial, and resurrection, we now are no longer under condemnation. Our sins are forgiven. We have, as it were, immunity for our spiritual crimes. And at Christmas, we celebrate our intercessor, that Jesus, as the scripture says, always lives to make intercession for us. And so we have these seven glorious truths that we celebrate at Christmas time. I want to go through them with you this morning, and we're going to spend most of our time on the first one, the celebration of the glorious reality and mystery of the incarnation. Now, we see this in verse 14. It says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. 
So verse 14 starts with a pretty simple and yet amazingly profound statement. It says that the children share in flesh and blood. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. Now, this first phrase that, that the children share in, in flesh and blood, at first glance, it just simply states the obvious, right? That we have bodies of flesh and blood. You can look around you, you can look down at your own hands, and you can see that human nature, we have bodies of flesh and blood. But there is a profound significance in this phrase because the word used for share, when it says that the children share in flesh and blood, that is the Greek word that you've probably heard before, koinonia. It's usually translated fellowship. It means to have something in common, to be united in something. And the writer here is saying that the children have fellowship in flesh and and blood. They have something in common. In other words, human nature, the nature of having flesh and blood, is common to all people. And I want to just point out to you how profound this statement would have been in the first century. In the first century, basically all of the national groups all thought that they were superior to everybody else. The Jews thought they were superior to the Greeks. The Greeks thought they were superior. The Romans thought they were superior. Everybody thought that they were superior. And now, here in the scripture we read that the children have koinonia in flesh and blood. They have a shared communion in a common nature. In other words, ontological equality is presupposed in this phrase. The equality of our being, the equality of human nature. It is shared equally by all. Now, of course, we know that God used a rich palette of colors when he made people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. But there is only one human nature, and that human nature is common to all of us. We share it. We have fellowship in it. We have koinonia with each other in the sharing of a nature that has flesh and blood. And so we're a lot more, we have a lot more in common than we are different. Uh, to use a car illustration, because I'm a guy, you know, we're, we're like a blue, a gold, and a green Corvette, right? We have different paint jobs on the outside, but inside we share the same nature. We have koinonia with one another in that common human nature. The human nature includes not only our spirit and our soul, but also our physical body, which is what this text is pointing out, that we have a physical body of flesh and blood. Now, why does the writer mention this nature of flesh and blood? I want to direct your attention to a very, very important problem that Scripture addresses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, Paul says this, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood, so here's the same phrase, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So there's the uh, dilemma here. The dilemma is this, how can finite mortal beings with physical bodies enter heaven and dwell with an infinite immortal being who is spirit? Remember the scripture says, God is spirit. And Paul in 1 Corinthians says very clearly, I'm telling you this brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, the perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. Now, when I was a kid I used to kind of think of heaven as being far away, right? You know, it's farther than the solar system, far, farther than the galaxy, farther than even, even the known universe. It's very, very far away. That's kind of how I thought about it as a kid. So I thought of the distance between earth and heaven as being one of distance. And so I would kind of wonder, you know, as a kid, is, you know, could it, would it be possible to build like a special rocket that would go so far that it could reach heaven? But as Paul said, there is no way for flesh and blood to inherit the kingdom of God. The perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. In other words, the chasm between our physical world and the spiritual dwelling place of God cannot be crossed. Because it's not a matter of distance, 
it's a matter of what we, what we might describe, try to use the word dimension. And even that would be a horribly inadequate concept to describe it. It's not a matter of physical distance. It is a matter of completely different realms of being. The point is that there is an uncrossable chasm between the creator who is spirit and the creation who have bodies of flesh and blood. And so the scripture says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There's an immeasurable, categorical, metaphysical chasm between the physical and the spiritual, between the finite and the infinite, between created beings and the creator. And so how can that chasm be crossed, right? We have, the writer says, koinonia, or fellowship, with each other because we share the same nature. But how can we, who have bodies of flesh and blood, have koinonia, or fellowship, with God, who is of a different nature, who is spirit? How can that infinite chasm between God and man, between the creator and the creation, be bridged? The first thing we need to do is acknowledge our own helplessness to bridge it. We can't cross it. There's nothing we could do, right, to cross that bridge. If there is a bridge that's going to be built across that chasm, it's going to have to be a bridge built from God to man, not from man to God. The solution will have to come from heaven to earth, not from earth to heaven. It will have to come from the spiritual realm down to the physical realm. It cannot be something that originates in the physical realm to try to reach the spiritual. It's going to come from the infinite world, not the finite world. To put it simply, man cannot reach up to God. So God, in his love, reached down to us. Look back at verse 14. It says, Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. Jesus, the Son of God, took on human nature. He partook of the same. This is the glorious truth, the mind-blowing reality of the incarnation. As John puts it, the, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God. And then he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, the eternally preexistent second person of the Trinity, partook of the same flesh and blood that we share. He took on our human nature, and in so doing, he bridged that infinite chasm between God and man. So Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, is that bridge, and he is the only one who could be that bridge. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the passage that I already quoted one verse from it where Paul says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. I want you to read, I want you to just hear the explanation. Just kind of listen along as I read Paul's explanation. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 35. Someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies, and that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, and another of flesh of beasts, another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthly. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also those who are earthy, and as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. But behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. 
In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, this mortal must put on immortality. For when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This passage teaches that Jesus is the bridge. He solved the problem, right, of flesh and blood inheriting the kingdom of heaven because he bridged the chasm between God and man. He saved us. He's transforming us. He will glorify us. In other words, beloved, Jesus shared our mortality so that we could share his immortality. He, he partook of human nature so that, as Peter put it, we could become partakers of the divine nature. Man could not cross the gulf between the material world and the spiritual world, between our sinfulness and his holiness, or between our mortality and his immortality. But Jesus bridged that gulf by his incarnation. And that was a bridge built from God to man, from heaven to earth. Human religions all try to build a bridge to God, from earth to heaven, from man to God, and they all fail because it is impossible for man to reach to God. Jesus, and Jesus alone can save us, for he alone came from heaven to earth, from the spiritual to the physical. He alone was fully God and fully man. As I already quoted in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. So the mystery and the glory of the Incarnation is the primary thing that we celebrate at Christmas time. As our text put it, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. We who have koinonia, fellowship with one another in flesh and blood, we can now have fellowship or koinonia with God because Jesus Christ also partook of our nature. Now notice what the last half of verse 14 says. It says, The children share in flesh and blood, so he himself likewise also partook of the same. Why? That through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And so the first glorious truth is the incarnation. The second glorious truth is the invasion. The invasion. He came in order to render powerless the one who had the power of death, which is the devil. For us, the coming of Jesus was a rescue mission. He came to save us from our sins, to rescue us. But for the devil, it was an invasion. It was an invasion of his dark kingdom. It was an invasion of his cruel hold on the human race. In Ephesians 2, 1, the devil is called the prince of the power of the air. Colossians 1, 13 says that Christ came to rescue us from the dominion of darkness. So when Jesus came as that helpless little infant, an infant that needed his mother's arms to lift him in and out of the manger. To us, this was the rescue of our souls, the salvation of sinners. But to the devil, this was D-Day. This was the invasion of his dark kingdom. It's interesting, um, when you read Luke's account, and the shepherds, you know, the angel announces to the shepherds the birth of Christ, it says something interesting. It says, Then appeared to them the angelic hosts singing and praising God. You know that word host there when it says angelic hosts is the Greek word stratia, which means army. Literally is the heavenly armies appeared to the shepherds. And they were there to sing and give praises to the Lord for sure, but they were there for more than that. This was part of that heavenly invasion force, right? And the ensuing battle between the forces of darkness, Satan and his demons, and then the Son of God and the holy angels was unlike any other in history. And our text tells us that it was actually the death of Jesus that disarmed the devil. It was the death of Jesus that disarmed the devil. The last part of our verse says, it says that through death, 
he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. In Luke 1, the angel revealed that Jesus was to be the eternal king, right? And so he's coming to save his people and then to establish his kingdom. But before he could save his people and establish his kingdom, he had to render powerless the hold that the devil had. And the devil's power was the power of death, according to our text. And so it was by dying and then conquering death through the resurrection that Jesus disarmed and vanquished our mortal foe. Jesus, through his death, burial, and his resurrection, conquered death, rendered it powerless, and therefore took away the devil's power. He conquered death, and when he conquered death, he disarmed the devil. That's why the verse we read in 1 Corinthians 15 says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? It has been rendered powerless by the resurrection of Christ. The devil's most powerful weapon rendered absolutely powerless over the believer. I want you to think of the incredible transformation that happened in regard to death. Without Christ, sinners are condemned. And so death is the gateway to hell, to eternal torment. But by faith in Christ, because of his death, burial, and resurrection, death is transformed from the gateway to hell to the gateway to heaven. This powerful weapon, this powerful, this power that the devil had was not only rendered powerless, it was now transformed for the believer. Death becomes, instead of the gateway to hell, it becomes now the gateway to heaven. So we celebrate the invasion of the kingdom of darkness. It looks strange from human eyes as an invasion force, a little infant in a manger. But notice how the devil took notice. He motivated Herod to try to wipe out all of the infants of that age range because he understood that this child lying in the manger was his undoing. This was an invasion of light into the darkness. As John puts it, the light has shone in the darkness. Into that dark and demonic kingdom came the Son of God bringing the light of the world. So we celebrate the invasion. Third, we celebrate our independence. Look at verse 15. It says, He came so that he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. He came to free us. He came to free us. And so we celebrate our freedom. We celebrate our independence from the kingdom of darkness. We've been set free. The chains are broken. We're no longer slaves to the world, to the flesh, to the devil. We're no longer slaves to sin and death. When Jesus invaded, he rescued us. He set us free. And so we celebrate our freedom, our independence. Fourth, we celebrate our immortality. Look at the last part of verse 15. It says, He came that he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives through the fear of death. We've been held captive as slaves through our fear of death, that looming gateway to condemnation. Of course we fear it. Of course we fear walking through a gateway that leads to eternal torment. And that's where we would be left if it was without Christ, is just simply facing death, which is a doorway to eternal punishment. But now, because Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, because he broke the power of sin and death through his resurrection, now we no longer need to fear death, because death is merely our entryway to heaven. I want to ask you to think about this. Do you fear death? Do you fear death? There's a natural fear of death. But Christ came to set us free from our slavery to that fear. As a believer, you should not be held captive by a fear of death. And in fact, getting past your fear of death is the key to a joyful and a productive life. Some people, I'm sad to say, are so afraid of dying that they never live. They're so afraid of dying that they never live. I remember when I was a kid, I got this big bag of candy at the holidays, and like kids do, I ate half the bag the, the first day. I woke up the next morning and looked at the 
bag. It was already half gone. I'd only had it for a day. And I thought to myself, it's going to be gone by tomorrow, and I'm going to have no candy. So what do you think I did? You know, what do little kids do? I began hoarding the candy, right? I began rationing it. I, I'd say, I'm only going to let myself eat one piece a day. And so I would eat one piece a day. And then there were some days I thought, no, I want the candy to last, and so I won't eat today's candy. I'll save it for tomorrow. And so I saved it and saved it and saved it. And, gu and guess what happened? It spoiled. It went bad. I wound up throwing away almost half of that bag of candy. In other words, I was so afraid of losing it that I never used it. That's the way some of us are with death. We're so afraid of losing our life that we never live it. So afraid of losing it that we waste it. We don't enjoy the blessings God gives us. We don't use our lives to serve Him. We're bound by fear, and so we waste our lives. Don't be a slave to the fear of death. Christ came to set you free from that fear. For the believer, Paul says, death is gain. Because we leave the suffering of this world and we go to be with the Lord. Some of you have been so busy cowering in fear of your fears that you're missing out on your best years. Your life is filled with fear rather than joy. Christ wants to set you free from your fear of death. There's been fairly numerous times in my life where the situations required uh, different circumstances where death was at least, you know, minimally a possibility or things could go wrong. There's a great temptation to shrink back, to turn away, to, to let fear decide rather than what needs to be done or what should be done. But when we do that, when we turn back because of fear, we fail to live. We fail to accomplish our mission in the world, we fail to enjoy the good things that God has given us. We live in the past. We live trying to hold on to that which we cannot hold on to rather than pouring it out for the Savior, knowing that we have eternal life. Why fear death when we have eternal life? If you know what's on the other side of death's door, you're not worried about when that door comes, whether it comes sooner or later. So for the believer to whom Jesus has given eternal life, who secured it with his precious blood and the power of his resurrection, we have nothing to fear, nothing, and no one to fear. So we celebrate our immortality. Fifth, we celebrate our inclusion. Look at verse 16. It says, for assuredly, this is interesting, for assuredly he does not give help to angels. Jesus does not give help to angels. But he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. At Christmas, we celebrate our inclusion in the gospel. Our inclusion in the grace of God. And there are two reasons why we should marvel that we were included in the gospel. Absolutely marvel. It should blow our minds that we're included in the gospel. Here's the first reason we should marvel. We should marvel that Jesus came to save fallen people when he did not come to save fallen angels. Angels are more majestic beings than us. And yet for them, there is no salvation. Jesus did not take on angelic nature and did not atone for the sins of fallen angels. When Satan and a third of the, the, the angels rebelled and became the demons, it was done. They were cast out of heaven. They were eternally condemned. The lake of fire was prepared for them, and there is no salvation for fallen angels. None. He, the text, verse 16 says, assuredly he does not give help to angels. It's emphasized. We know for sure that there is no help for angels. The lake of fire is described as being prepared for Satan and the demons. And we should marvel that we, who joined in Satan's rebellion, and we also sinned against God, that we are included in the gospel, that he does give help to us. 
When we think that a third of the angels rebelled, joined Satan's rebellion, they were condemned, and for them there was no salvation, we should realize that should have been our fate as well. That's what we deserved. We joined the same rebellion. A lot of people stumble. They ask, how, how could God condemn anyone? You don't understand the holiness of God. The question we should be asking is, how can God save anyone? In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, it says that the angels long to look into the gospel. They long to look into how can rebels against the Most High be saved? How can that be? They long to look into it because for their fallen compatriots, there is no gospel, there is no salvation. So angels long to look into the gospel. They marvel that God would extend grace to these lowly creatures. To save angels, Jesus would have had to take on the angelic nature and atone for their sins. Since they're so much more majestic and powerful than we, it seems that is what he would do, isn't it? But instead, he took on human flesh and died to save us, to save you and me. That is what we call grace. Undeserved, unmerited, unearned grace, mercy, love. We should marvel over that. The second reason we should marvel is that we were included in salvation even though most of us are not physical descendants of Abraham. Look what it says. It says, Assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. I don't know about you. I'm not a physical descendant of Abraham. The descendants of Abraham were God's chosen people. The promise of the Savior, the Messiah, was given to them. And so we should marvel when we read Romans chapter 11 and it is explained to us that we were grafted in. We were included in the messianic promise. We have become descendants of Abraham's faith even though we are not his physical descendants. The Gentiles have been included in the salvation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That, again, is grace. It's pure grace, undeserved grace. Ephesians said, look, we were without God and without hope in the world. We were cut out from the covenants of promise. So the fact that we are included in the hope of the gospel should make us marvel. It is pure grace. Well, our sixth reason to celebrate Christmas is our immunity. Look at verse 17. It says, Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. We celebrate our immunity because Jesus has made propitiation for our sins. The wrath of God, which we deserve, he bore in his body on the, on the cross. He paid for our sins, bore the wrath of God for us, and then he rose from the dead, showing that, that his sacrifice was accepted, that he had broken the power of sin and death. And so therefore we celebrate our immunity. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore no condemnation for those who who are in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord, right? We've been given immunity from eternal prosecution. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because Jesus paid it all. And notice that there was only one way that could happen. Our, our text says, verse 17, therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things. Only the one who is fully God and fully man could do this. He had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Only Jesus could be the perfect sacrifice for sins, and therefore he is the only way. The rebellion was by man, the sin was by man, and so the guilt belonged to man, and it must be paid by man. So Jesus had to be made like us in all things so that he could make propitiation for us. Man sinned, so man must pay the price. And that is why the full humanity of Jesus is so important. That's why we celebrate Christmas, because he who was fully God became fully man so that he could pay the price for our sins. If he had not been born in Bethlehem, 
He could not have died for us on the cross. We could not be saved. And it is only because he could represent us that we can have eternal life. Well, the last thing that we celebrate at Christmas is our intercessor. Look at at verse 17. He's called the merciful and faithful high priest. And then verse 18 says, For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. He is our merciful and our faithful high priest. And he's able to come to our aid. Turn over to Hebrews 4, verses 4, 14 through 16. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He's a faithful and merciful high priest who understands us, who sympathizes with us, who intercedes for us. He literally walked in our shoes. He knows what it's like to be tired after a hard day of work. He knows what it's like to be betrayed by a close friend. He knows what it's like to lose a close friend to death. He knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to be mocked and mistreated. He knows what it's like to be hungry and thirsty. He knows what it's like to die. He knows what it's like to feel pain and sorrow and grief. He can sympathize with us as a merciful and faithful high priest. He understands because he lived among us. And so we can run to him, we can cling to him, we can turn to him with confidence for help in time of need. Hebrews 7, verses 23 through 25, summarizes it all so beautifully. The former priests, right? People are always looking for a priest, someone to stand between them and God. They often disappoint. The former priests, on one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. We celebrate our intercessor. Jesus always lives to make intercession for us. Then verse 26 It was fitting for us to have such a high priest. Think how disappointed people are in human priests who have turned out to be unholy and not innocent and defiled. But think about Jesus, our faithful and merciful high priest. Verse 26, it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because this he did once for all when he offered up himself for the law appoints men as high priests who are weak but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever he is our faithful our merciful high priest who is always interceding for us and who is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Isn't it glorious? Isn't it glorious? Well, at Christmas we celebrate the incarnation, the invasion of the kingdom of darkness, our our freedom, our independence, our immortality, our inclusion in the gospel, our immunity. There's no condemnation for us if we are in Christ. And we celebrate that Jesus is our intercessor. These are amazing gifts, but they are received by faith. And so I would like to ask you today, do you believe? Do you believe? John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Lord, how we worship you and thank you for leaving heaven to come down to us. We who share in flesh and blood were hopeless and helpless, and yet you, because of love, 
partook of the same. You walked our land, and then you suffered and died for us, rendering the power of the devil powerless, defeating death, defeating sin through your resurrection, and opening a way for the mortal to have immortality, for flesh and blood to be transformed, for the perishable to become imperishable, to give us eternal life. For this, we are eternally grateful, and we rejoice with great joy as we celebrate your birth. In Jesus' name, amen.